Okay, our last speaker, Professor Owens. cold water. Um, it to be my age, things aren't falling off, so I'm sure this gluing me back together. Let me start by showing you, most of you remember from your math class, a sine wave. This is a financial sine wave. Okay. Starts with optimism, goes through excitement, thrill, euphoria. God, am I smart. Then it hits anxiety. Well, this is a temporary setback. I'm a long-term investor. Then it goes into denial, fear, desperation, panic, finally ends up in pure despondency. Then starts back out with depression, hope, relief, and back to optimism. This is pretty much what we're going through. Now, why raise the sine wave? Anybody who saw the stock market yesterday can't believe your previous two speakers, not if you're heavily invested. We dropped 223, ended up down 180. That was a rough one. Right? And it's not unusual. We're having, seeing these kinds of changes constantly. For those who've been following the news in the last few days, um, President Obama was not well greeted at the G20 Economic Conference. He is not being well handled at the European Economic Conference. Part of the problem is a reference is something that uh, Pat referred to, and that is quantitative easing. We're in our second stage, QE2, the $600 billion. This morning, uh, the New York Fed bought back $12.84 billion worth of long-term treasuries. The problem from the perspective of international, and that's my area, is that most of that $600 billion is probably going to leak overseas. We're using it to buy goods and we're jamming the inflation into other countries. That's why they were unhappy <laughs> with Mr. Obama and with our economic policies. China's inflation this year, they prefer 3% max, is already at 4.4 and climbing. They've raised their interest rates last month for the first time since 2007. The thought is they're going to raise them again. That's one of the reasons the market hammered yesterday is all of a sudden we're looking up and saying, China may start to slow down. And you have to recognize that is the second largest economy on the face of the earth behind ours. They are ahead of Japan now. China is now number two and growing fast. But with growth comes inflation. With inflation comes concerns of price increases locally. And the fear is they may start putting the brakes on that economy. And if they do, things they sell us get more expensive, things they buy from us become less obvious. There is a second group of countries that are cold water. They are in the European Commission. <laughs> they go by the name of pigs. I didn't invent it. It is Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain are four members of the Eurozone. Greece, the G of the pigs, has already been bailed out. Ireland, the I of the pigs, is under intense pressure today to accept a bailout. Their banks are totally underwater. The government stepped in and backed them, and they don't have the money to cover the debt. If you think the housing inflation in Las Vegas was excessive, you should see the property bubble Ireland just went through. And when it burst, it wiped out virtually all the Irish banks. They are being bailed out by their government. Their government doesn't have the money. So they are being effectively encouraged strongly by the European Union, the Eurozone Commission, and the International Monetary Fund to accept a bailout. Now, obviously, politically, if you are their version of the prime minister, their finance minister, that's sort of the end of your career. Let's be honest. The sanctions that will be imposed in the event of a bailout 
will be very severe. For example, when Greece was bailed out, they jumped their value-added tax rate from 19 to 24 percent. That's a bite. They're telling Ireland the same thing. Ireland agreed with its unions, we will not cut jobs. One of the conditions of the bailout was we're going to renege on that agreement. Jobs will be cut. Basically, what's happening in Europe, and it's a contagion that is spreading, thus the P for Portugal, the fear is they are next, and then finally Spain. The fear is that as this contagion spreads, the restrictions you have to put on these countries to cut spending and raise taxes are very, very severe to pay back that debt which will diminish the ability of those economies to absorb goods that the rest of us produce. Right? For example, Ireland's corporate tax rate is 12% right now. That's how they draw people in. The thought is, if they are forced to accept these bailout provisions, that will more than double. So if you just located your plant in Ireland to get a nice low corporate tax rate, that deal just ended you're now stuck with 20 plus percent. So you can see why the Irish are resisting. But the European Union and the Eurozone Commission basically is saying we cannot have a bankrupt member of the Eurozone. That's unacceptable. Otherwise the Euro is in danger and therefore the whole idea of a common currency and a common economy is in danger. So they will accept the agreement. We thought last night during the Brussels meeting of 12 uh, that it would be finalized. It is not. As of this morning, they have agreed there will be a three to four day consultation between the Eurozone Commission, Ireland, and the International Monetary Fund. We should know by Friday the conditions of the bailout. The thought is when they have one, Portugal's next. Now, I don't like to use numbers, but let me tell you just a little bit about the pigs in brief, because I want to make a point. One is that the P, Portugal, the government debt is 76% of their gross domestic product. They owe three quarters of what they produce. Okay? Their deficit is about, <laughs> at the moment, 9% of GDP. The I of the pigs has a 65% debt as a percentage of the gross domestic product. The G in the pigs, Greece, has 126.8%. That's upside down. When you owe 126% of what you produce, you've got a problem. Greece is not going to get out of the water for a long time. Spain, which is the healthiest of the pigs, has a 53.2% government debt as a percentage of GDP. The United States, depending on how you count the debt, has a 93% debt of GDP or a 64%. If you don't count Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, if those are not considered debts, and in fact they are because we've already spent the money, and I hope all of you get really good jobs because I'm counting on my share. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm drawn some and I'm intending to enjoy it for a long time. So you need to become very well gainfully employed. It's one of the reasons I work hard in my classes. I encourage my good faculty members, train them well. They need the job because I need the money. But if you don't count those three, and I think you should, but if you don't, we have 64% debt to gross domestic product. In the Eurozone, the United States would be considered a candidate for a bailout. Now there's a sobering thought. Now why is that happening and what can, in effect, the U.S. do about it? One is some of the issues that Pat and Gary have raised. That is, we've got to continue to try to grow. We've got to continue to create new jobs, new products, etc. 
The other issue very much is not only as Amarillo, but nationally, we've got to find a way to cut back these expenditures. Whether you call it reducing the loans or cutting the expense, it's the same game. It's all the same coin. What is happening is we are passing right now our borrowing cost to cover excess spending on to other nations and on to future generations. At some point, that comes home to roost. The reason I talk about the Eurozone countries, the pigs, is we have felt ourselves to be above all this. We're not. We're in the same economic situation they are. It's just we don't have a Germany staring us down and saying, you will take a bailout. You will not endanger the rest of us. We stand alone. So we can, in effect, ignore it for a while, but it's still there. And as a consequence of that, we need to be very supportive of programs, as heinous as they may be, to cut expenses and get the revenue up. Whether it's through productivity or higher tax rates, whatever it takes. But these debts have got to be paid down. Otherwise, there will come a day of reckoning, and it will be an exceedingly painful period. You can see what's happening in those other countries. And it's, nobody's ever, we are, uh, by virtue of being a reserve currency, we're in a position nobody's going to tell us, here's what you got to do and when. But what will happen is, from a low interest rate, we will vault to a very high interest rate environment, and it will cut off productive capacity. That we don't want to have happen. We need to be willing to get a hold of this and keep these taxes low, keep the interest rates low. So it's the only way we're going to come out of it. But if you've been watching it lately, it's been kind of fun to observe. But for those who were curious, yesterday's market was largely driven by those two events. China's higher reported inflation in the pig group, and particularly the Irish member of that group. Right? You're going to see a lot more of this in the days ahead. So get ready for more volatility in the U.S. market. What happened was when China announced that, Shanghai market dropped 4% that day. By the time it got to Europe and we found out about the Irish problems, all of the European markets, particularly the Frankfurt market and the uh, French market, all went down 3%. Right? So we went 4.4, down to 3 it hit the U.S., we went down 1.6. Well, the only difference is the scale, the size of the numbers. Right? If you've got 11,000 of the uh, Dow Industrial versus a CAC or a DAC of, in Europe of four or 5,000, basically we all took the same hit globally. Right? So that news directly <coughs> came right into our market. What we do goes into theirs, what they do comes into ours. We are that linked right now. Literally, I can get up at 4 a.m., check the Shanghai market, and I can tell you pretty much what the U.S. market is going to do today. Right? Also, somebody mentioned about the free closing, about the GM um, offering. <laughs> it's kind of fun for those of us in finance. GM this morning announced they are increasing the size of the common stock offering by one-fourth to meet excess demand. This is stock being sold by a bankrupt company owned by the U.S. government. And there's an interesting thought that we are so desperate for possible growing investments that GM is able to, a bankrupt company is able to sell stock at a price higher than they initially thought in a quantity of 125% of the original amount. If you think the world is not slightly financially nuts, <laughs> you haven't been watching. <laughs> well, why is it for most Americans and our lawmakers that they don't want to take that big bite and say higher taxes that they can't balance the budget for that? Same reason the two Irish men don't want to take it. You're out of business. You're on a new career track. They just do not have the courage to stand up and do it because they know they're going to be voted out. It's going to be unpopular. So it's going to be painful. 
and people don't like to lose their jobs. Truly, the Irish situation has been drug on for days because of the self-interest of two people, a prime minister and a finance minister. That's what's holding it back. Otherwise, we'd have settled this thing last week. But these guys are both dragging their feet because they don't have a job when this is done. Where are we at on your side? I would put us part way down the downslide. We're not at despondency, but we went way past I'm a long-term investor. Uh, I'm hoping we're, we're starting to come back out of it in the U.S. I think we've gone through the worst, but we're by no means back where we were in, in terms of general optimism. If we don't address this long-term debt, what's the ultimate price we'll pay? You're going to be about three generations from now, we'll still be paying it. You're just going to keep compounding it to the where it becomes un unbearable, at which point <laughs> you move the decimal points and everything over two places and start again. It's the only solution, you go to hyperinflation, and we don't want to go there. Others? Sir? My concern with the region's economy is that there are like these opposite views, the local perspective very good, and uh, the global. national perspective is very worrying, and uh, I see that I don't think the region is prepared for what is coming next. I think is this this uh, good situation is kind of uh, explained by the isolation of the region, but it's not gonna it's not gonna be like that in the, in the coming year. So what can the region do to be prepared? for the globalization, I think we, we cannot keep ourselves isolated. It's not going to happen, so. Well, I think uh, Pat mentioned one of them is when the housing boom started, we didn't participate. Um, and, and let's be honest, I mean, some of us were insanely jealous. I've got academic colleagues I went to school with who bought houses in Seattle and sold them for three times the price. They were smart enough to get out on the peak right before the Dreamliner decided to crash in Laredo. Um, for those who weren't watching the news, they had to crash land the Dreamliner in Laredo, Texas this week because a cockpit caught on fire. All right, that's Boeing's new dream plane. That's supposed to solve all the problems. Life is not good in the real estate market in Seattle right now. That's a little tough. But basically, I was jealous of those people, but by the same token, but my house didn't, it certainly hasn't gone up three times. Um, the reward has been, I haven't had the downturn. I, and I think Pat and, and Gary's comments are, are valid. It's a different kind of business community. The isolation does help, but we haven't done the euphoria thing. What, if, what I see is that the, the region depends uh, very, very depending on the government, uh, Economy. I mean, the Bell helicopters or the subsidized agriculture, mm -hmm. you know, actually the money coming here is coming from the government. Uh, what? Well, 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 so yeah. If the government uh, will face harder times in the future, we're going to feel it. So, what can we do? I mean, we cannot keep ourselves. Isolated. That's my that's my concern. The, the con I, and I, I see your concern, but the issue again is if you look at our two primary defense-related ones, the Pantex and Bell helicopter, the money's going to keep flowing. We're disassembling bombs now. I mean, we're the only place in the world that can take them back apart. We're taking apart Russian bombs. You know, the nuclear weapons. We may build a few, but we're spending we're, most of our money now is on disassembling. And that's not going to stop. There's a lot of that going on. And then I think in terms of uh, Bell Helicopter, um, my daughter just returned from Iraq from a, a tour of duty over there. Um, believe me, those people are not giving up their Ospreys. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got a, a military, and, and before the government gets too proud, you got to remember you armed them. Um, but don't tell them they can't have their Ospreys. They're, they want those planes. Uh, Gary, would you like to 